did you, does this come in a Nephilim yeah. size? Yeah. <laughs> Rephaim. So my wife is here, you know, she's in the back, and you might see some hand waving. Uh, she does that occasionally. She's not interpreting for the deaf, it's just signaling me. So this means you made your point and bring it in for a landing. And this means, you know, it's time to sit down. So we've been married 42 years, seven months, and a few days, so approximately. So I talk a lot about Bible prophecy. Uh, we try to communicate things. We, I do a prophecy update each week. Uh, and also teach on different uh, Bible subjects, but mainly related to Bible prophecy. That's my thing. Uh, I so appreciate uh, getting to know Jacob. I met Jacob. First heard him at a conference at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, back in 2004. And my reaction was, I'm, si I'm sure it's similar to um, a lot of you, was, who is this guy, and where's he been all my life? And I've learned so much from Jacob, and we became friends over the years, and he's been very, very helpful in uh, the establishment and growth and encouragement in the growth of Fellowship Bible Chapel and our ministry there. Uh, and our pastor, Steve Mitchell, you know, has known Jacob even much, much longer than that. And I'm very uh, humbled to be able to speak at a conference with him. So tonight, I'm going to talk about uh, this subject, the Vegangelicals. Now you're going to, I'm not going to give you the punchline for a little while. I'm going to do an introduction. In Matthew chapter 24, as I'm sure you've heard Jacob say many times, when Jesus is warning about the end times, I'm standing in front of the screen? Oh, so don't, okay. So there, see, I don't even know those hand signals yet. So those are new ones. Um, when Jesus is talking about the end times, he talks about the things that we should look out for. And there's earthquakes and famines and pestilence. We all know those. But as I'm sure you've heard Jacob say, and as I've said many times, more times than anything else, he warned about deception. And Jesus answered and said unto them, verse 4, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And verse 11, And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. For there shall also arise false Christ, verse 24, and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. In the book of Jude... And I don't think there's any mistake that Jude is placed in the Bible just before Revelation, just before a lot of what unfolds in the end times. Jude writes, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. And we know that this is an important part of what a pastor, a teacher, and elder should do. In Titus, it tells us that not only should a pastor and elder teach sound doctrine, but they should be able to refute false doctrine. Now, I grew up in an evangelical church. My father was a pastor. And I can take you and I can show you a, a sermon that my father gave at the Grace Brethren National Conference in Long Beach, California in August 1970. I went back and read it recently. Uh, you can find it online if you know how to dig down and find it in the old Grace Brethren archives. And the interesting thing was, in 1970, he was talking about the same thing I, I talk about today. Because Dad and others saw that there was coming a time that the evangelical church was really falling away from the faith. It, would no, it was no longer contending earnestly for the faith. And that was in 1970. And this is a theme throughout the, the book of Jude. He wants to talk about our common salvation, but he says, I have to address these other issues. 
verse 4, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how the how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. In verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set, set, forth as, set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Verse 10, but these, speak evil, but these speak evil of those things which they knew not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit, but ye, beloved, building your, up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Verse 22, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now, I mentioned that I still refer to myself as an evangelical because that's how I grew up. I grew up in an evangelical church. It meant something. And a common complaint that I hear now from a lot of people is that it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean anything. We need to come up with a new term. I mean, it used to mean that you stood on salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ you stood on the authority of the Word of God. And now, it just doesn't mean anything. And this has been going on for a long time. It kind of goes in waves. One of the waves that, uh, a crest of the, con the controversy over evangelicalism and what it would mean, occurred back in 1922. There was a, a pastor of a Presbyterian church I think First Presbyterian Church in Manhattan, named Henry, Henry Emerson Fosdick. And in May, uh, May of 1922, Fosdick delivered a sermon titled, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? Now at the time, there was a controversy between him and J. Gretchen Mason, who had come out talking about Christianity and liberalism. And a lot of the things that we see going on in the evangelical church today are exactly what was going on 100 years ago, although I think they're just magnified, and the problems that were seen 100 years ago in the mainstream Protestant denominations with the liberalism that had come in are now spread throughout all of evangelicalism. And as a result, we're to the point where we need to refer, either restore what the term evangelical means, or come up with another term for these people who are trying to change it and destroy it. So Fosdick delivered this sermon, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? I'm going to read a fairly long passage of it because I think it's important to understand where it was that he was coming from. Listen to what he said. 
And these are just some clips out of that sermon. This morning we are to think of the, and by the way, Fosdick was a liberal. I would say that his progeny today would be guys like N.T. Wright and others who pretend and get, uh, you know, church leaders go around and pretend that they're Christians when really they're not. And I think a lot of times these guys think that they're profound, but they're really theological frauds, I guess is the best way to say it. Not the nice way to say it, but it's the truth. So this is Fosdick's sermon, Shall the Fundamentalist Win? This morning we're to think of the fundamentalist controversy which threatens to divide the American churches as though already they were not sufficiently split and riven. A scene suggested for our thoughts, our thought is depicted in the fifth chapter of the book of Acts, where the Jewish leaders hate, hail before them Peter and other of the apostles because they had been preaching Jesus as the Messiah. Moreover, the Jewish leaders proposed to slay them when in opposition Gamaliel speaks, refrain from these men and let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, ye will not be able to overthrow them, lest haply ye be found even to be fighting against God. It is interesting to note that where the fundamentalists are driving in their stakes to mark out the deadline of doctrine across the church, around the church, across which no one is to pass except on terms of agreement. They insist that we must all believe in the historicity of certain special miracles, preeminently the virgin birth of our Lord, that we must believe in a special theory of inspiration, that the original documents of the scripture, which of course that we no longer possess, were inerrantly dictated to, uh, to men a good deal as a man might dictate to a stenographer, that we must believe in a special theory of the atonement, that the blood of our Lord shed in a substitutionary death placates an alienated deity and makes possible welcome for the returning sinner. And that, and you know what I see as I read through this and I've, I've looked through this, at least the truth was getting out there. He was mocking it in his own way, but at least he was at least laying out what the fundamentals of the faith were. And that we must believe in the second coming of our Lord upon the clouds of heaven to set up a millennium here as the only way in which God can bring history to a worthy denouement. Such are some of the stakes which are being driven to mark a deadline of doctrine around the church. He goes on, in the evangelical churches today, there are differing views on this matter. One view is that Christ is literally coming externally on the clouds of heaven to set up his kingdom here. I never heard that teaching in my youth at all. Uh, parenthetical comment. My dad loved Bible prophecy. I heard it all the time. He would have prophecy conferences. And people would come and the speakers would come over and have dinner and they would sit there and they would talk about really deep stuff about Bible prophecy. It wasn't surface stuff like you get, if you get it at all in a lot of churches today. So that's what I grew up with. Fosdick went on, it has always been a new, re it had always had a new resurrection when desperate circumstances came and man's only hope seemed to lie in divine intervention. It is not strange then that during these chaotic, catastrophic years, and this is just in the years right after the First World War, in which tens of millions of people died, a number which, by the way, paled in comparison to the deaths estimated to be as high as 65 million people worldwide. Probably three times as many people died in World War I, died in the aftermath of World War I in the Spanish flu epidemic. It's something, about as many people died in the Spanish flu epidemic as died worldwide in World War II. But it doesn't get the same kind of discussion. He said, it is not strange then that during these chaotic, catastrophic years, there has been a fresh rebirth of this old phrasing of ex expectancy. Christ is coming, seems to many Christians, the central message of the gospel. In the strength of it, 
some of them are doing great service for the world, but unhappily, many so overemphasize it that they outdo anything the ancient Hebrews or the ancient Christians ever did. They sit still and do nothing and expect the world to grow worse and worse until he comes. There's a reason why they think that. Because it is. We live in a world where you, I mentioned this in my update last week, there are colleges in England where you get marked down if you use he or she as descriptives of people. You have to use a special word, zim or zay or whatever. It's insanity. It's just, it's a denial of basic science for one. Fosdick continued, side by side with these to whom the second coming is a literal expectation. Another group exists in the evangelical churches. They too say Christ is coming. They say it with all their hearts, but they are not thinking of an external arrival on the clouds. They have assimilated as a part of the divine revelation the exhilarating insight which these recent generations have given to us that development is God's way of working out his will. They see that the most desirable elements in human life have come through the method of redevelopment. And these Christians, when they say that Christ is coming, mean that slowly it may be, but surely his will and principles will be worked out by God's grace in human life and institutions until he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. What, are, what were those people he was describing? They were dominionists, people that think, we're going to do such a good job of building the kingdom of God that Jesus won't have any choice but to come back because we're, look, look at what great job we did. Now, personally, I think this is the definition of insanity. In 2,000-year history of the church, I would challenge you to point to me any place on the planet, even in a small community, that has been able to replicate anything approaching what the kingdom of God will be like when Jesus comes to rule and reign. It hasn't happened in 2,000 years. But man's ego always gets in the way, and, and they think, well, we can do it, because we're better than any of them. And so you have this whole group, and you see them on TV, a lot of the people on um, TBN and other places. These are people that think, we're going to build the kingdom of God. Fosdick said to this, in such an hour, delical and dangerous, when feelings are bound to run high, I plead this morning the cause of mar magna magnanimity and liberality and tolerance of spirit. And what you find when a liberal or a leftist like Fosdick speaks what they're doing is they are projecting. You know, they, they say they're tolerant when they're the most intolerant. And most of the time, they lie. And they're usually wrong. Um, as I think a radio talk show host I listen to says, it's like Germany. In geopolitics, Germany is, general, is usually wrong. And it's true that they are. And it's people like Fosdick, they're wrong all the time. Uh, just a few more quotes. I would, if I could reach their ears, say to the fundamentalists about the liberals what Gamaliel said to the Jews. And then he quotes from that verse that we read at the beginning. As I plead thus for an intellectually hospital, tolerant, liberty-loving church, I am, of course, thinking primarily about this new generation. Do you see the, the, the a hundred years ago, we were getting the same nonsense from the liberal Christ-denying Protestants that we now get from a lot of the evangelicals, the people who call themselves evangelicals. We have boys and girls growing up in our homes and schools, and because we love them, then we may well wonder about the church, which will be waiting to receive them. Now, the worst kind of church that can possibly be offered to the allegiance of the new generation is an intolerant church. Ministers often bewail the fact that young people turn from religion to science for the regulative ideas of their lives, but this is easily explicable. If during the war, when the nations were wrestling upon the very brink of hell and at times all seemed lost, 
you chance to hear two men in an altercation about some minor matter of sectarian denominationalism, could you restrain your indignation? You said, what can you do, what can you do with folks like this who in the face of colossal issues play with the tiddlywinks and peccadillos of, of religion? So he made some good points, but like Germany and geopolitics, Fosdick was wrong on almost everything when he came to his conclusions. Francis Schaeffer, many years ago, wrote a book called The Great Evangelical Disaster. And what he came up with was, uh, somebody recently summarized what he said, there were 10 things that Schaeffer saw, saw were damaging to the evangelical church. Relativism, lack of discipline, compromise, social work, a focus on social work, a focus on ecumenism, the issue of abortion, liberalism, hedonism, loss of propositional revelation and inerrant scriptures. And so what, what Schaefer said roughly 40 years ago is what we see in much greater detail today within what is still called the evangelical church. People challenge the inerrancy of scripture. They, well, you really can't know this, and as long as you feel that it's true, it's true. Someone a few years back came up with a term to describe this new brand of evangelicals and called them evangelifishes. And you know what, they, the, the, they were essentially spineless, squishy people who questioned the authority of the Bible, unable to stand for anything, and always changing. We see this today. I thought I'd get a, a contemporary example, and here is Justin Welby, Archbishop, Anglican Church in England. An article in British GQ last week. Here's the interview. Alistair Campbell's asking the questions. This is the, this is the leader the Anglican Church today, this, this just a couple weeks ago. Is gay sex sinful? Well be. Do you know, we have done religion, we have done politics, why am I surprised that we are on to gay sex? Questioner says, because I feel sorry for them who keep being asked this question, so I'm asking you. Well be. You know very well that is a question I can't give a straight answer to. Sardly, bad, sa sorry, badly phrased there, I should have thought that one through. Why can't you? Because I don't do blanket condemnation. I haven't got a good answer to the question. I'll be really honest about that. I know I haven't got a good answer to the question. Inherently, within myself, the things that seem to be absolutely central are around faithfulness, stability of relationships, and loving relationships. But could that be a man? and a man or a woman and a woman? Well be. I know it could be. I'm also aware of you deeply held by tradition since long before Christianity, like since the beginning of the human race, within the Jewish tradition that marriage is understood invariably as between a man and a woman. So what did, what did Welby do there? He marked himself out as an evangelifish. He couldn't, he didn't have the spine to take a stand based on what the Word of God says. And that's just a symptom. Schaefer mentioned growing ecumenism. Here is an interview done a few years back by one of the Catholic channels of a pastor I'm sure you'll recognize as the author of uh, maybe the best-selling, and I'll use the Christian book in scare quotes of all time. Listen to this. Okay, now it's not working. Um, hang on, folks. My, uh, okay. Excuse me for a moment. Let's see here.
When we do this at church, this is the hardest thing we do is getting all the sound to work correctly. And we have a great team. And I'm not seeing my uh, option here at all. Ah, there we go. Okay. Pray. until noon and I would light some candles and I would start writing and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and then one of the things I did before when okay. I was writing Purpose Driven Life it took me seven months 12 hours a day mm -hmm. I'd get up at 4 30 in the morning I'd go to a little study start at 5 a.m. it was fasting till noon and I would light some candles and I would start writing and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and one of the things I did before I uh, read I uh, wrote the book was um, I asked the question, how do you write a book that lasts 500 years? For instance, um, Imitation of Christ by Thomas Kempis. Right. Uh, Practicing the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. Okay, The Desert Fathers, St. John of the Cross, Teresa of Evola, all of these great classic devotional works. And one of them, I, saw, I just realized that in order to be timeless, you have to be eternal. Now listen, every book, every single book he cited in that list is heretical. And Jacob can correct me if I'm wrong. They are based on Catholic and other mysticism. They are not evangelical. They are not Christian. And so what do you see here? You see, frankly, a chameleon. When he's speaking to the Catholic audience, he will cite Catholic sources as if those are good, acceptable sources. They are not. This mysticism is destroying evangelicalism from within. It's going in through our evangelical colleges and seminaries in the form of spiritual formation. I wrote a very long paper on it because of things that I saw going on, and I can tell you that it has not changed. There's a lady named Philena Hurt. She runs around teaching mysticism at evangelical colleges, going to their chapels like Taylor University in Indiana, like Biola University in California, and others. Her husband, Christopher Hurwitz, promotes something called the Enneagram. It is a new age, sort of a psychological evaluation technique now. But you, would, you look through the people that run the Enneagram Institute, and they will admit we are ancient New Age mysticism. And they're promoting it. There was a conference. There was a Catalyst conference in Dallas a few years ago. Philena Hurts came and did her little Lectio Divina contemplative prayer thing with the pastors. The Catalyst conference is put on by a guy named Andy Stanley son of Charles Stanley, has a huge church in Atlanta called North Point Church. And in the experience kit, and I can show you this, I just don't have time tonight, in the experience kit that was given to the, all these pastors, to the couple thousand or so that paid their $700 or $600 or whatever it was to come to the conference, you all paid that tonight, right? <laughs> in the experience kit was a package so that they could go back and they could have the Enneagram evaluation done on themselves and two others on their staff. So you had Philena Hurts doing the prayer, you had her husband Christopher doing the Enneagram. You know Warren came out, there was a book called Catholics Come Home by Tom Peterson and on this, this is Rick Warren's endorsement of this book about bringing people back to the Roman Catholic Church. The mission of Tom Peterson and Catholics Come Home, this is a direct quote, to bring souls home to Jesus and the church is critically important during this challenging time in our history. I fully support this new evangel evangelization project, evangelization project. Here's a little bit more of that interview with Warren. 
The Vatican recently sent, sent a delegation here they did. to Saddleback, yeah. the uh, Pontifical Council, the Academy for Life. Right? The Academy for Life, exactly. Tell me what they discovered and why did they come? This was a this was a sizable group. It was. There were about 30 bishops from Europe. Um, one of the men who had been uh, actually trained and mentored by Jean Vanier, oh. and which is an interesting thing because we have a retreat center here, and my spiritual director. Uh, who grew up at Saddleback, actually uh, went and trained under John Vanier too. Oh. So I'm very excited about that. Um, but they were talking about the new evangelization, and Saddleback uh, has been very effective in reaching secular mindset. Uh, our church uh, is 33 years old. Easter 2014, and, uh, Saddleback is uh, our 34th anniversary. And in 34 years, we've baptized 38,000 adults. Now, these are adult converts, people of no religious background, people who say, I was nothing before I, I, I came to Saddleback. So we figured out a way to reach that mindset. And I fully support the Catholic Church's new evangelization, which basically says we've got to re-evangelize people who are Christian in name, but not in heart. Right. And, and they need a, a new, fresh uh, relationship to our Savior. New and fresh. Does he support this or not? You heard his own words. Now, I could, I could show this to people, and they would say, that's not what he said. Now, listen, um, I'm a lawyer, a trial lawyer by training. And... Uh, I'm an evidence guy. Somebody was asking me about this. Well, why do you believe this? And I'm like, I believe the Bible because I'm an evidence guy. And I see the evidence. I was just in Israel. Pam and I were just in Israel back in May for a couple of weeks. And we went places we'd never been before, like Hebron and Shiloh and Shechem and Mount Gerizim and other places, Ai, Bethel, Jericho. And let me tell you this. I'm an evidence guy. And guess what? The evidence of the historicity of the scriptures is overwhelming. And, I would, and I'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow, about some things we learned on our trip and how it ties in, I think, with prophecy and end times and that type of thing. I, I'm concerned. I've, I've been around the evangelical church all my life. I've seen the deterioration. And... Frankly, it's, it's over, okay? We need to just say it's over. The remnant needs to move on. And I know people stay in churches for a long time trying to save them and get them to turn around. And I, I, I'm sure it's happened, but I'm just not aware of more than a few isolated incidents. It's... It, it's over. I mean, it's, I'm stunned. I, I was actually at Saddleback. I went down there a few times. My in-laws live in Southern California. We spent a lot of time out there. So on Saturday night, I thought, well, I'm a few, I did this about half a dozen times. Be, why? Because I guess I'm a glutton for punishment. I went to Saddleback to church. Uh, I was sat there one night with my good friend Bill Koenig. Some of you may know who he is. And uh, I noticed him making little marks on his program or whatever it was that he had. The first time I went, the one thing I noticed was I was the only person in the range of my vision that had an actual Bible. The only one. When Katie and I went, he was, I said, so what, what, what were your statistics? I knew what he was doing. I said, what were your results? He goes, well, 14 Bible for, he quoted the Bible 14 times, and he used nine different translations. I was there one night. He got up, and he said, I just happened to be there. And he walked, I said, I've got a new thing that our church is going to be doing. You're the first ones to hear about this publicly. Let me introduce to you the peace program. I happened to be sitting there that night. And I'm sure you've heard our brother Jacob talk about this. So the new term, and this is the doubt, I've got the intro, and you're looking at your watch, and you're like, 
he's used up half his time to get the intro done. And that's not unusual. Vegangelical. What is a vegangelical? Well, here is the definition of a vegangelical. No meat and no milk. And you can be proud of it. I'm a vegangelical. There's passages about this. One of them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writes to the Corinthian church and says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither are yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? And Paul was telling them, you know, I want to give you meat, but I have to give you milk. But see, the modern evangelical church has gone even a little bit further where you don't even get the milk. So you are the evangelical. In uh, Hebrews chapter 5, for when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Second Timothy chapter 4, written at a time when Paul knows that he's about ready to die. I did a series once called Famous Last Words. Now, when we, there are, there are certain things, there's a thing called hearsay that is of questionable admissibility in a court of law. But one exception to the hearsay rule is a dying declaration. Why? Because the assumption is in the law, in the common law of, of Great Britain and England and America, is that when you're getting ready to meet your maker, you're going to tell the truth. So there's some credibility to what you're saying. So that's an exception. We'll allow that information to come in as evidence in a case. By the same token, when somebody like the Apostle Paul is sitting there facing death, I think it's important to look at what, what was important for him to say to Timothy. And he said this, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, and is appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. And so he reiterates what he had said in Titus about elders, you need to not only teach sound doctrine, you need to refute the false stuff. And sadly, today, a lot of people don't refute the false stuff. They don't even really want to admit that there is false stuff out there, let alone refute it. And I know from personal experience that when you start refuting things, what is the usual refrain that you hear? I'm sure some of you have heard this. You're divisive. Right? You're divisive. And it says in Titus, does it not, to reject a divisive man? But when you unpack what the Scripture really says in there in Romans chapter 16, the divisive man in Scripture the root word in Titus, where that word is used, and is hereticos. A heretic. It is the false teacher who is divisive. And so Paul goes on to write, for the time will come, and Paul identifies who's the divisive person. And remember, Fosdick goes, well, I'm so wonderful, I'm tolerant, and all this other stuff. Fosdick was a heretic. He was the most, he was as divisive as they come. 
And Paul talks about people like him. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So people in the evangelical church have to make a decision. Which way are you going to go? It's a fork in the road. My wife's aunt once, we were down in North Carolina, and they lived in the mountains there, and she gave us directions to her house. And she said, well, when you come in through the gate at our community, just go straight, okay? So I came to a road that looked like this. And I said, which way is straight? And Pam goes, I don't know. So I took the right side. We ended up on top of a mountain on a little tiny lane where the pavement ended trying to turn around to come back. And we came back and we took the other side and we drove up and my wife's aunt was sitting there tapping her foot on the porch going, you didn't go straight, did you? And I'm like, it's the mountains of Marge. Her name was Marge. It's the mountains of North Carolina. There ain't straight anywhere. And I determined that what she meant by straight was go the right way. That, that's what they mean in North Carolina. But this, this decision is made by a lot of people. There's a great little interview recently uh, in Premier Christianity with Bart Campolo, the son of Tony Campolo, uh, who's considered to be one of the progressive, liberal, evangelicals, tolerant, loving, supports nonsense like Christ at the checkpoint and that sort of thing. And his son, Bart Campolo, who was considered one of the leading names of the, what we call the emergent or emerging church. Well, Bart Campolo is now the atheist humanist chaplain at the University of Southern California. Listen, I, I want you to listen to this because I think it's a warning flag for everybody in the evangelical church about what, what will happen. And when you see churches playing around with social justice and helping the poor, and I'm not, I'm not saying don't do that, but when you emphasize that, this is what happens. Listen to some of this interview. I passed through every stage of heresy, he said. It starts out with sovereignty. It starts out with sovereignty goes, then biblical authority goes, then I'm a universalist, now I'm marrying gay people. Pretty soon I don't actually believe Jesus actually rose from the dead in a bodily way. And, and, and I'm grateful that he told the truth. Because this is exactly the progression as to where it goes. Listen to this. Speaking on a recent episode of the Holy Heretics podcast, Bart explained his journey away from Christianity began when he was exposed to urban poverty. It messed with my theology. He explains I had a theology that said God could intervene and do stuff. But after a period of unanswered prayer, Bart admits I had to change my understanding of God. Sovereignty had to get dialed down a bit. Campolo admitted that changing his view of God's sovereignty was the beginning of the end of his faith. Why? He says, because once you start adjusting your theology to match up to the reality you see in front of you, it's an infinite progression. So over the course of the next 30 years, my ability to believe in a supernatural narrative of, or a God who intervenes and does anything died a, death of a, died a death of a thousand unanswered prayers. Campolo continued, I passed through every stage of heresy. It starts out with sovereignty, goes, and then what I read you, eventually you're denying everything in the faith. Campolo doesn't think he's a special case. On the contrary, he believes the current world of progressive Christianity, what he calls the ragged edge of Christianity, is heading towards full-blown unbelief. Now, he's not a prophet. That's just reporting the facts, in my view. Speaking during the Wild Goose Festival, the American version of Greenbelt, Bart was clear. What I know is there's a, thousand, there's a thousand people at Wild Goose today 
then in 10 years from now, three or 400 of those people won't be in the game anymore. And here's a picture of a Lutheran pastor from the Denver, Colorado area, Nadia Boltz Weber, uh, radical feminist and um, a tattoo uh, canvas, I guess you would say. Campolo, could, uh, well, there's that same quote again. Campolo is predicting that as many as 40% of progressive Christians will become atheists over the next decade. Let me correct that fact. They're already atheists. They just don't know it. And somebody needs to, like Jude says, grab them like you're pulling somebody out of a fire, shake them by the throat, and tell them the truth of what's going to happen to them. In his view, the process of abandoning Christian doctrines is almost addictive. Once you start, you don't know where to stop. It might begin with dialing down your view of God's sovereignty, but it could easily end up with unbelief. When you get to this ragged edge of Christianity, he says when people say God, they sort of mean the universe, and when they say Jesus, they sort of mean redemption. They're so progressive, they don't actually count on any supernatural stuff to happen. They dialed it down in the same way what I did. This man was a lead considered by many, even in conservative evangelical circles, to be a leader in the church just on the emergent side. Now, you don't hear a lot about the emergent side much anymore. You know why? Because they're everywhere. <laughs> the battle was lost. People stopped fighting. They surrendered. There's a lesson for Christians in Campola's words, a statement, once you start adjusting your theology to match up to the reality you see in front of you, it's an infinite progression, should make all of us think. Another example of this is a man named Rob Bell. Consider one of the top 25 evangelicals. He wrote a book called Love's Wins when he really questioned the existence of hell. And I know churches and colleges that sent people there because his ministry was a model ministry. He was so good. And if you've ever read a Rob Bell book, and I'll confess that I did, and I actually shredded it so nobody else would be able to get it. I didn't just throw it away when I finished with it. It's called Velvet Elvis. And if you read a book, he charges like 25 bucks for these things, and most of the pages are white space. So my theory of a Rob Bell book is the most valuable thing in a $25 Rob Bell book is the white space, because that's where he won't damage you. So love wins, and people are like, he's denying, oh. Time Magazine did a cover article on, well, what's Rob Bell doing? How did he... Listen, if you listen to him, and I did, because I saw people following after him, <coughs> the fact that he ended up denying hell was no surprise. It wasn't. He's got a new book out. What is the Bible? How an ancient library of poems, letters, and stories can transform you, conform the way you think and feel about everything. Like this, this you may have seen this clip. I've used it a number of times. Church going to get that? We're close. I, I think. think it's evolving. I think mm -hmm. it's lots of people are already there. She asked him about gay marriage. Okay, and this is Rob Bell and his wife, Krista. We think it's inevitable, and it's, we're moments. A moment away from the church. Yeah, absolutely. It. Absolutely. Really? So I you, you, you think we're moments away? I think culture is already there, and the church will continue to be even more irrelevant when it quotes letters from 2,000 years ago as their best defense. What did he say? No, you really said that. The church will continue to be even more irrelevant when it quotes letters from 2,000 years ago as their best defense. So is he, where do you think he stands on the authority of Scripture? So that's a pretty overt example. Here's Andy Stanley. 
and some series. He has a huge church, I think 25,000, multiple campuses down in the Atlanta area and elsewhere. And here's just a number of clips from some sermon series that he's done recently. And the reason why I do these clips is I, not that I like to torture you or anything like that, although it's really kind of fun to watch your reactions to this up here. But I, want you, I don't want to put words in their mouths. As I said, I'm an evidence guy. And the most effective evidence a lot of times is what a person says. And so here they are. And listen, you can go look them up on the internet, watch the whole thing, and I challenge you to prove to me that I've taken these out of context. I have not. Here's just a few. You were taught, as I was taught, Jesus loves me, this I know, and let's all finish it together for the... Yes, this is where our trouble began. Because the Bible tells me so. That's what he's objecting to. Perhaps you were taught, as I was taught, Jesus loves you. Well, that's the same quote. Christianity, don't miss this. Christianity does not hang by the thread of the Bible tells me so. And if your church sent you off to college with that house of cards, I apologize. And if your entire life, your whole thing has been, I gotta defend the Bible, I gotta defend the Bible, uh-oh, there's information that looks like it contradicts the Bible, I can't look over there, honey, don't look over there. I'm so sorry you were left with that fragile version of our faith. Does it sound like he's attacking the authority of the Bible? Here's more. In other words, imagine this conversation. You know, somebody with all this information, you know, comes to the, to the Apostle Peter. Let's say the Apostle Peter and says, Peter, hey, before you get all geeked out on this following Jesus thing, do you realize there's no evidence for a worldwide flood? Hey, hey Peter, before you get all crazy about the Jesus thing, do you know that there's no archaeological evidence for the Exodus? Hey, gee, hey Paul, but before you get all going, Peter, before you go crazy about the Jesus thing, you realize that okay, the earth is more than 6,000 years old, that whole genealogy in Genesis. Peter would have looked at you like, I'm not really sure what you're talking about, but, but I followed a man for three years who spoke like no other man spoke. He was arrested and crucified and we thought game over because he said too much to be a good teacher. He claimed too much about himself to be a good teacher. Game over, we're all in hiding. A bunch of women come babbling that the tomb is empty, the tomb is empty. I looked into an empty tomb and do you know what I concluded? Somebody stole the body. And a few days later, I had breakfast with my risen friend on the beach. So I'm not sure about 6,000 year old earth. I'm not sure about archeological evidence. I'm not sure about all that. The reason I'm following Jesus is because I saw him die and I saw him alive. And I went into the streets of Jerusalem to say, God has done something among us. For the first 300 years, the debate centered on an event, not a book. For the first 300 years of the existence of Christianity, the debate was about an event, not a book. The question was not, is the Bible true? Is the Bible true? Is the Bible true? The question was, did Jesus rise from the dead? But I wasn't there to see that. And none of you were. But we know that it's true that Jesus loved us because the Bible tells us so. And, and see, here's the problem. Um, Jacob, what do you say? There's always a little bit of cheese in a rat trap, or real cheese in a rat trap. And this is the problem. It, what Bart Campolo said ought to be a warning beacon siren to the people that follow Andy Stanley because it's just a little chink here and a little chink there and pretty soon you're, you're gone. I may mention this tomorrow. If I don't, I'll have done it 
um, Pam and I went to Jericho in May, where Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho, and the walls fell down. We, there's a big parking lot there. On one side is the Tell of Jericho, ancient Jericho, at least what's left of it. And on the other side is the thing called the Temptation Cafe. And we met the owner of the Temptation Cafe because he knew the person who was taking us there, Joel Kramer, great biblical archaeologist and apologist. And while we were there at lunch, there were thousands. I mean, it seemed like hundreds, if not thousands of people coming through the buffet lines at the restaurant. And I'm wondering, how much does this guy that owns this restaurant make? I mean, it's just incredible, 25 bucks a pop. And dozens of buses coming through, all filled with pilgrims. We were there for a few hours. I, I know I saw somewhere between 75 and 100 buses full of 50, 40 to 50 people or more. Other than Pam and I and Joel, one group, one group walked from here to the back of this building to the tell of Jericho to see the evidence of what happened there. Why? Because some lady named Kathleen Kenyon, who was a pro-Palestinian and I think a demonically driven person to deny the history of the Jewish people in the land of Israel, wrote that there was nothing there at the time. There is stuff there. There's evidence. It's all over Israel, and yet people deny it. And evangelicals go there, and people tell them, well, we're not, that's where they say this Jericho thing happened, but there's a lot of problems with that. And they cave, and they give up. And so the next is, not just the people that take the time to go to Israel, it's people like Andy Stanley going, hey, you know, there's no evidence of all those <coughs> biblical stories. Nonsense. The evidence is there all over the place. I've walked up and down those hills. I've seen it. I've analyzed it. And I know it's true because the Bible tells me so. More from Andy. Because the issue has never been, is the Bible true? The issue has always been, who is Jesus? Here's some more. In other words, imagine this conversation. You know, somebody with all this information, you know, comes oh. to the... Before the Old Testament and New Testament were combined and titled the Bible, this is unbelievable. Christianity had already before there was a Bible, had already replaced the pantheon of Roman, barbarian, and most Egyptian gods, and it was the state religion of the Roman Empire. And no one had ever held in their hand a Bible. If the Bible is the foundation of our faith, as the Bible goes, so goes our faith. This is why you sent kids off to college or grandkids off to college and they came back with no faith. Because you sent them to college with a, the Bible says it, that settles it. And then a professor got up and says, well, there's problems with the Bible. And they begin to talk about things that are, maybe aren't true or historically you know, verifiable. And your smart son or daughter that you spent thousands and thousands of dollars to get them educated come home and suddenly they're smarter than you. And they already thought they were smarter than you, but now they have a professor saying, hey, you really are smarter than your Sunday school teacher and your parents. If the Bible is the foundation of our faith, here's the problem. It is all or nothing. Christianity becomes a fragile house of cards religion. Christianity becomes a fragile house of cards that comes tumbling down when we discover that perhaps the walls of Jericho didn't. When somebody in a, you know, archaeology class or a historical, you know, an ancient his history class says, you know, you may have heard in Sunday school that, you know, the, the Israelites marched around the walls of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. But, you know, we've excavated the city of Jericho and there's no evidence that the walls came tumbling down. By the way, while we're on it, there's no evidence that a Hebrew people, you know, made some sort of trek from Egypt to Canaan, what they call the Holy Land. There's no archaeological evidence of that. Do you know there are all kind of contradictions in the Old Testament? There's all these facts and figures that don't add up 
up from Kings to Chronicles to 1st and 2nd Samuel. By the way, the Bible seems to teach that the earth is only 6,000 years old. Everybody knows that the earth is, you know, four and a half or 4.55 billion years old. The universe is 14 and a half billion years old. If the, if the Bible, if the entire Bible isn't true, then the Bible isn't true. And if the Bible isn't true, Christianity comes tumbling down. So consequently, during your whole lifetime and during my whole lifetime, Christians have felt compelled to defend the Bible because the only way to defend the Christian faith is to defend the Bible. And what your students have discovered, and if you read broadly, you've discovered, it is next to impossible to defend the entire Bible. But if your Christianity hangs by the thread of proving that everything in the Bible is true, you may be able to hang on to it, but your kids and your grandkids and the next generation will not. Because this puts the Bible at the center of the debate. This puts the... Sp okay, I have to stop that because it's... Uh... Do you think that a Christian kid that's grown up in a church where he's heard that is going to be able to defend himself against the onslaught of professors at a secular university or college? They don't have a chance, and they will fall away. And someday, guys like this will stand before a righteous, holy God as judge and have to defend what they've done. So, as Jude says, it's really, you know, 47 years ago, my father was talking about this, and I'm, I'm like, his, he would be sitting here tonight, and he would be like, Turn that off! You know, stop it. It's not true. The Bible is true. I'll talk a little bit about some of that tomorrow afternoon after lunch. And um, the, um, I'm going to exercise mercy. And I'm going to stop it. I have one more clip of him, but I'm, two more, but I'm going to stop. And I see I'm almost out of time, so let's do this. In Ezekiel chapter 8, it talks about Ezekiel. He's in the, um, he's given a vision of the temple, and he's taken through the temple precinct and area. And as they get deeper into the temple, there's more and more problems. And what they find is there's false worship going on, there's idolatry, there's what... Look at the abominations going on around you. And so I would say to the people that are in these evangelical churches, look at the abominations that are going on around you. And just like in Ezekiel's time, the people who are most guilty of it are the leaders. It's the same pattern that happened then that's happening now. And now we're getting ready for the return of of the Lord as judge and executioner and king. In um, Boxing Day 2004 in Indonesia, an earthquake took place. And as a result of that, over in Thailand, you know, well over a thousand miles away across the Indian Ocean, people were on the beach in Thailand, and what they noticed was that all of a sudden the water backed out of the bay. And here's a picture of it from a documentary done about the Boxing Day tsunami. You, I know you've read about this. 300,000 people died. 300,000, 250,000 in Indonesia alone. And here in, in Thailand. And so you see these people, they're out there, they're walking around. Hey, look, we can walk around the coral reef. We don't even have to get, you know, just our feet wet. We don't have to put on a snorkel or anything. This is great. It's pretty. 
And then all of a sudden, people see this white cap on the horizon. And you'll, if I had the audio up in this, you would hear people are going, well, what is that? What? Look at that, all the way across the horizon, this giant white cap. And somebody says, oh, it's a tsunami. <laughs> no, it's not a tsunami. And then all of a sudden, the people, the local people that realize, see here, this, this is the caption. Maybe the earthquake did that. Maybe it's a tsunami. No, nah, it couldn't be. That's, I mean, my eyes are telling me that it might be, but nah. And then the locals start running. And they say, and you can see them starting to run. And the other people are just standing there looking at it. Isn't that cool? We have to tell them, they're saying, look at it coming. So look, these people that you see walking around out there, they're all gone. Because they ignored what their eyes showed them. What they knew was real. This guy right here, he's dead. 300 some thousand people died that day. You see, God's judgment is, I think, and I know Jacob and Mike both feel this way as well, God's judgment's coming very soon. It's the, we can see the tsunami coming. And it's time to warn people. It, there are so many areas in which to warn people. It's, you know, Jacob's doing a prophecy update. I'm doing a prophecy update. And it's, um, it's tiring. Because it's, every, it's everything now. It's culture. It's geopolitics. It's economics. It's nature. It's on and on and on and on. It's just, I think this is it. I really do. I don't know how long, but I do know this, that the people that got the message, they made it through. But the rest, they were swept away in God's judgment. They were swept away just as people will be swept away in God's judgment. So it's time. So this is not a trivial thing, this false teaching that goes on in the church. And yeah, I tried to be clever with the title, Vegangelicals. No milk, no meat. No warning.